socialstudiesgames.us. We're in Unit 7. This is Video 1, as always, based on the APUS History Guidelines. So we're going to talk about U.S. domestic policy, which we've kind of pretty much already done a lot with the industrialization, big business versus labor, and the government's role in that. We're also now going to expand outward and see how do the progressives during this time and the uh, the U.S. government deal with foreign affairs. We'll get to that in a couple of videos, but right now we'll stick mainly to domestic policy. Defend Widow Wilson's government protection of consumers, inflation, and the Fed. That's going to be in the next video. We're mainly going to focus on Woodrow Wilson, the president, Democrat, progressive, his policies in terms of protecting consumers. Consumers are the people that consume or buy things. It's you, not necessarily big business. They are the producers. They make it, they sell it, you consume it. So Wilson, this guy, is going to be all about trying to protect you, the consumer. So before he gets elected, he is in a campaign against Theodore Roosevelt, although Roosevelt is not really his Republican rival at this time. He's for the Bull Moose Party, but he is the former president that we had just studied. So we use him as an example. They are both progressives, meaning that they're progressive ideas or ideas that are based on progress quotation marks, but they are new ideas. They are not old ideas. They are not traditional ideas. They are not conservative ideas. They are basically saying the old way that we do things that doesn't necessarily work. We need new, bold ideas that have never been tried before because we need to make major changes. That is a progressive idea. And we have progressive today who say, hey, the way we're doing it, it's not going to work. We need a major change. We need to do this for these people. And we need to stop doing this. And we're, we're all these things that we're doing, they're wrong. And people are like, I don't know about that. That's a new scary idea. That's what a progressive idea is. Now, sometimes they make major changes that help the world. Sometimes they step too far and we fall off the world and very, very bad things happen. Both of these progressive minds believe that the government needs to be strong and active in controlling big business. They need to regulate business. They need to regulate the robber barons, the producers, and make sure that they're not cheating the workers, the laborers, the consumers. We need, the government has to be involved. They do not believe in laissez-faire economics. They do not believe in the hands-off approach. The government needs to be involved making sure that the meat that we're eating is safe and that the railroads are not cheating us and that the businesses aren't forming monopolies that are jacking up the prices on consumers and that people have fair wages. The government has to get involved to make things more fair. Now, one of the differences between the two is that Theodore Roosevelt believes that you're going to need a big government to establish this. If you want to be able to regulate business, it's going to require a large government with various departments and many government employees to keep big business in check. Whereas Woodrow Wilson promises, no, 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 we don't need a big government. We'll keep the government small, but we'll still be able to do that, which is kind of ridiculous. If you want to regulate the railroads and regulate the meatpacking industry and regulate labor and make sure that the consumers are protected and make sure that monopolies aren't, that requires a bunch of different government departments and all across the country and it requires employees and all those departments all across the country regulating, investigating, taking businesses to, to trial, collecting evidence, gathering evidence from workers, working with the people, working with business. It's a lot. So Theodore Roosevelt was not naive in saying, look, if you want to clean up the environment, if you want to regulate business, it's, it's expensive and this is what's required. Whereas this sounds nice. And so people were kind of attracted to the idea of, oh, he's going to do it for less. You got it, Woodrow. Also, Theodore Roosevelt, part of his platform, when we talked about platforms before, these are their beliefs. These are their ideas. This is what they say they're going to do to get you to vote for them. Now, well, Roosevelt doesn't really have a chance. He's a third party candidate. Third parties in this country never win. But one of the interesting things that third parties do is they introduce new ideas that eventually the main party will um, absorb and take a part of their own uh, or appropriate would be the word where the uh, he's not going to win, but his idea eventually will find its way into the mainstream and everyone will say, well, yeah, that's a great idea. Although he never gets elected, the idea eventually becomes a part of cultural norms and governmental norms. One of these progressive and way out there and a crazy new idea during the turn of the century around the beginning of the 1900s, the 19 teens is the idea of welfare. And you're probably thinking, huh? What, what? Welfare is a brand new idea at the time. And some may say it's a progressive idea right now or even today. But we have welfare and all these programs, this graphic that I'm showing you is all these welfare programs exist today. Roosevelt, 
Ted here is the first person as his campaign promotes is, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to help out the poor. I'm going to help out the needy. I'm going to help out low-income families by giving them temporary assistance. Bad things happen. The government's going to give you money to help you out. This exists today. If you lose your job, you can go to a government agency and apply for unemployment. And while you look for another job, the government will send you money to help you pay for your rent, help you pay for your bills, help you pay for your loans, help you get food on the table. The government will help you out. Did not exist for the longest time. He is the first presidential candidate to a to pr uh, promote or propose this progressive idea. SNAP, Situational Nutrition Assistance Program, which in the past was referred to as food stamps or your EBT card. This is where the government says, look, you're having trouble paying the bills. You don't earn very much money. You have kids. The government will step in, give you money every month to help you buy food. So the government helps low-income families pay for food. Medicaid, this is health care or health insurance for the poor, for children and for low income families that cannot afford health insurance. The government says, fine, we'll pay for it for you, which is basically taxpayers doing that. But you have to take care of the people is what Roosevelt says. You can't just let people starve. You can't let people just die we as a country, if we have the means, we should provide these welfare programs to people. SSI, if you have a disability or you cannot work today, the government says, look, we get it. You have a disability that makes it unable for you to get a job and to work. We are going to give you money to help you live the best life that you can. Housing assistance. I know, unfortunately, we often refer to these places as the projects, and that's unfortunate, but some people struggle to pay for homes and we do not need Americans across the country being homeless. And so what happens is the government gives money to families to pay their rent. In some cases, it pays their full rent. In other cases, they pay a portion of the rent, but they help families that have money because if you you're not just kicking a person on the street in most cases. You're kicking a person that and children, five years old, three years old, eight years old. That child did nothing wrong. Why should they be homeless? And so the government, according to Teddy Roosevelt, should step in and help people out with housing assistance. And then the earned income tax credit is just another example today of the government helping those in need. And then last, votes for women. At this time, women did not have the right to vote. The Constitution did not say that women could vote. It also did not say that women could not vote. It was up to the individual states. Ted Roosevelt says, look, all women in every state should have the right to vote. You vote for me, we're going to make this happen. Unfortunately, ladies, Woodrow Wilson is going to win this election. Again, remember, he was a third-party candidate. He was coming up with progressive ideas. Third parties introduce new ideas. Eventually, those new ideas become mainstream ideas, like the right to vote for women. He does not win. Woodrow Wilson wins. He didn't have a chance. He was a third-party candidate. Wilson, though, is a progressive as well. So, ladies, you're going to be all right. And his plan, as opposed to the ideas that we just talked about for Teddy Roosevelt, was the triple wall of privilege. Oh, God, that privilege word. That's a loaded word today. His plan is to stop unfair. Oh, there's that other word. Bank practices. Stop trust, which we also call monopolies, and end high tariffs. You may not know what a tariff is, but we will go into it in a second. A tariff is a tax on importing or exporting good goods, mainly importing, like shoes or cars or computers. If it's made in another country and it comes into this country, there is a tax for bringing it from that country to this country. He says, we need to end that tax. We need to stop it. Why does he want to do this? Why does he want to do this? Why does he want to do this? This is a lot of things, by the way. You're going to get a small government's going to, a small government's going to do all this, Wood? You sure, Woody? Well, that's what he says. The reason he wants to do it is he wants to help out the consumer. This is a long word to write out this way. He does not want to help out the elite, the wealthy, the ruling class, the business owners, the rich. Why does he feel, feel such disdain for these people? I don't know, but he loves the people, wants to help them out. This is his plan. It's triple wall privilege. So number one, tariffs. Again, are taxes on importing goods. So imagine you got a pair of shoes that are made over in England. 
You ship them over to England, bam, we smack a tariff onto those pairs of shoes. That was five buckaroos. Now it's actually $7.50 because you got hit with a 50% tax. Now we're used to taxes of 7% or 8%. When you buy a soda for a dollar, it's a dollar seven. That is a sales tax. Now I'm making it 50% to show uh, an exaggeration, but a lot of cases there are tariffs that are very, very large. I'm using this to get a point across. Because if I show you a tax that's only a mere pennies, it won't get the point across the way that I need to, to show you that tariffs are actually kind of bad. So now, instead of a $5 pair of shoes, it's a $7.50 pair of shoes. And you might be saying, why do that? Why increase the price of shoes? That cost me more. I got a $5 pair of shoes. Now it's the same exact pair of shoes and it cost me $7.50. Gee, thanks, Woody. What are you doing? Let's explain why exactly Woody Wilson is doing that. Because not only do they make shoes in England, but guess what? They make shoes here in America too. But unfortunately, because American workers are more expensive, they cost more, it costs more money to operate the business in America, or for whatever reason, there's a lot of different variables that happen throughout time. And the same stories exist then, that exist today, that existed in the 1700s. This tariff issue is still today. You'll see that Donald Trump, talks about this and our political leaders are constantly debating about tariffs. And they were in the 1990s under NAFTA and Bill Clinton. And they were in 1780 and in the 1800s with Alexander Hamilton was talking about tariffs. This ain't going away, folks. Get used to it. A lot of the stuff that we study in this class existed then and it's still being debated today. Like, well, why haven't we figured that out yet? Because you can't figure this stuff out. There are are no solutions. There are no solutions. There are only trade-offs. If you decide one way, if you decide to help people A, then you hurt people B. And if you help hurt people B, then you hurt people A. There's no winning in social studies. When you make one decision, there's an effect on the other side. And if you help something else, then you change something on the other side. You just try to do what's ultimately the best or, or the least bad decision. I know it sounds crazy. This is not science. This isn't math. There aren't an answer. There's no answers. Get it out of your mind. And it's not just for social studies class. It is for life. In life, you deal with this too. There often isn't a solution. You just have to make the best choice and deal with the consequences, deal with the trade-offs. And sometimes you change your mind and it fluctuates. And so we will be debating this. When you are 70 years old, they will still be fighting about, should we have tariffs? Should we not have tariffs? In this example, shoes cost more to be made in America. So the reason why we slap a tariff on, well, see right here, without a tariff yet, you buy the shoes over here for five bucks. They're a better deal. It's the same exact pair of shoes. Of course, you're going to spend $5 for the shoe instead of $6 for the shoe. Unfortunately, if you don't buy American shoes, American businesses go under. Now you're probably like, well, who cares about the rich business owner? Sure. But that means less factory workers. And if less people have jobs, then we're spending less money. It means less money in the economy. And then eventually even more factories go down. And it goes down and down and down. The economy never grows. So one of the theories about, hey, we can help protect or help our economy. And you hear this conversation a lot. Maybe not in terms of shoes, but in terms of making cars or other things, furniture, any other things that we make in this country, a lot of times we say, we need to stop buying from them and buy from our own country. And if we buy from our own country, we will create more jobs and the economy will go up. So ship the shoes over, you slap a tariff on, the price has now gone up. And so now all of a sudden, and that's bad for you. Yeah, ah, no, I gotta spend more money on shoes. But now you say that $6 pair of shoes, that's not so bad. I'd rather spend $6 then $7.50. So yes, this hurts you. Good for this guy. But when you buy American, U-S-A, it creates U-S-A jobs, not jobs in the UK. Their jobs go down and who cares about them? And then he's got money. He spends money. We create more factories. More factories mean more factory workers, more spending money. And it all happens because we created this tariff. That's why we have tariffs. That's why Alexander Hamilton said in the beginning of our great democracy in the 1800s with America, he said, look, we've got to create 
tariffs to protect American industry. Otherwise, American industry will never develop. We'll never become one of the most powerful countries in the world unless we protect our factories. We're going to continue to buy from England, who's already powerful. When we buy from them, we make them more powerful. And eventually, if they get too powerful, maybe eventually they'll come back and take us over again. We got to protect our economy. And that's the same thing that Donald Trump is saying today. What? Alexander Hamilton's really cool. And he's all like Donald Trump. I'm not saying any of that, but I'm just comparing their beliefs. One of the beliefs that Donald Trump and the Republicans have, which is crazy because it was actually used to be a Democrat idea. Now it's a Republican. It's, it's all gets switched around. The Democrats believe in up and down and Republicans believe in up and down. It's all, if I'm confusing you, then I'm confusing you. Either way, tariffs protect the American economy. It helps out the rich business owner hurts you. And remember, Woody Wilson is all about you and not about the rich business owner. So his plan is to get rid of the tariff. Now, when you have the tariff, remember, it jacks the price up and that hurts you. It helps the business owner. That's great for them, but that's bad for you. And Woodrow Wilson wants to help the consumer. So he gets rid of the tariff. He gets rid of that high price, back to $5 shoes, too bad. Sorry, rich business owner. You're just going to have to find a way to lower the costs to, to compete. You're going to have to find a way to compete on your own and not be protected by the government. Imagine that. Is that so bad that our businesses, our USA businesses must find a way to compete with other countries and they shouldn't be given uh, handouts by the government? You know, it, it's up to you. Well, maybe it's impossible for them to be. By the way, you now have more money in your pocket, a whole $2.50. Well, gee whiz. But that adds up. That means something. You would much rather keep the money than this guy have the money. That's why you get rid of tariffs. That's why Woodrow Wilson uh, proposed that. He wants to stop trusts. They're also known as monopolies. Again, it's all about protecting the consumer. Doesn't care about the business owner, the property owners. So in this example, you got Jane, you got Wanda, you got Jojo Siwa. I didn't know she was into uh, real estate. I guess she is. She's in everything. Jane, Wanda, and JoJo, you've got all these different competing hotels. They all want your money, and they're trying to convince you, come stay at my hotel. Come stay at my hotel. Well, look, in this world, all these are four-star hotels. They're all perfect. They're all great. So, of course, you're going to go with Wanda's hotel. You want to stay at Wanda's place because it's cheaper. Well, what happens if there's a monopoly? What is a monopoly? A monopoly is where one person owns all of the goods or services. And when they own everything, and that is all the competition is taken out, like right here before. The reason why Wanda's charging less is because she needs to convince you to come to her place. She's competing against Jane and JoJo. And the best way to get you into her hotel is lower the price. And that competition between these has driven the price down. Now there's no longer competition. It's Jane, it's Jane, it's Jane. Jane's not competing against anyone. Jane doesn't have to lower her prices for anyone else. And so what Jane does is it's 300, 300, 300. Oh, you don't like that price? Oh, you don't like my $300 hotel price? Then fine, go find somewhere else. Oh, wait, there isn't anywhere else. You don't have any options. You got to stay here. You got to stay here or you're out sleeping in the cold. Go ahead, sleep on the cold, see how that street works out. Uh, I'm sure, I hear it gets cold at night and we've got a rat problem in this city. So you know you probably wanna spend the $300. And that's what you can do if you're able to create a monopoly. You control all of one product. That's what the game Monopoly works. Remember if you get a hotel here and you get a hotel here, and then finally you get this property, you can start jacking up the prices. If you only own one of them, you can't do anything. But once you own all three a monopoly, the price goes up because you have a monopoly. You have cornered that market. If someone wants to stay somewhere, they've got to pay whatever you tell them to pay. And if they aren't willing, then they don't stay. There isn't any competition. Well, Woodrow Wilson says that's bad. I got to stop this because remember, he's about protecting the consumer. So he creates the Federal Trade Commission. Federal Trade Commission. And trade is a fancy, that's not even a fancy word. It's a word we use for business, right? Have you ever traded something with someone? You're trading uh, a pair of shoes for another pair of shoes. You trade shoes for a video game. You are trading. That's a transaction. That's business. You do that in real life. When you buy goods, you are trading your dollar bills for a pack of Skittles. That's a trade. They say, we will give you a pack of Skittles and you will give us a dollar bill. That is a trade. So the Federal Trade Commission, and a commission is just a name for an organization. So federal means the entire U.S. 
has a group or a commission that will monitor trade or monitor giving dollars for stuff and giving stuff for dollars or trading stuff. Their job is basically to regulate business between businesses and between you and businesses. And so the Federal Trade Commission says we have to protect the consumers. We have to prevent monopolies. This is not good. Jane is hurting the consumer. So they break it up and they say, look, you got to get rid of the hotel. You got to sell it to somebody else. You're not allowed, Jane. Jane cannot own every hotel in Hotel City. And eventually we have more people. JoJo gets a hotel. Wanda gets a hotel. Now we have competition. They want to be the best. And the way to get the more people, most people into your hotel is lower your prices. You got competition again, and everybody is going to JoJo's hotel. Triple wall privilege plan in the high tariffs. We talked about it. Remember, we talked about that. And we talked about stopping monopolies. It's all about protecting the consumer. Police. And then an another example for protecting consumers. So we got to prevent monopolies. We also want to prevent fraud. Again, federal, the U.S., a commission, a group, a federal group is going to regulate trade. Remember, trading goods back and forth, selling. They want to protect you so that businesses are not cheating you. This happens today. And here is a famous example from your lifetime. Do you remember these Shape Up shoes? They still exist. You can still buy them. But when they came out, Skechers made the claim that now these are all the claims so sketchers when they were selling you or trading you these shoes told you that they would improve your posture oh that sounds great improves blood circulation oh tell me more tighten my abs what i gotta get these shoes straight in my back oh no firmans firms my buttocks muscles oh well, now you got me i need a toned butt I need a I need firm buttocks muscles and reduces cellulite. Oh man, my cottage cheese legs are out and I'm going to look like a supermodel. All I got to do is buy a pair of shape ups in my life. Look, does this sound ridiculous? Does this sound like crazy that they are going to promise you that these shoes are going to do all of these things? Do they cure cancer too? Why stop there? Why not give me a job to do this job? They make me super fast. Can I dunk in these shoes? This is a preposterous claim. This is ridiculous to promise this. Now you can say maybe it helps tone your butt muscles and it might help your posture, but they were out there saying, look, this thing's going to change you rock and roll or roll and rock. That's what they said. And people bought these shoes and thought, man, it, everything is going to work out. This is going to turn my life around. And the reality is, it's a lie. It's not true. Sketchers, you cannot say that. You cannot make that bold of a claim unless you have evidence or research that proves it. Show us the scientific studies that show that these shoes are making people's booties look good. Please provide that evidence. Show me the evidence that has given all these dudes six pack abs. Well, they could because it didn't happen. And so Skechers was forced to give the money back to anyone that bought these shoes. That is what now, obviously Woodrow Wilson died many years ago. He wasn't a part of this incident, but the government idea and concept that he promoted and created eventually led to this. He created the Federal Trade Commission. They've done many things over the last hundred years of how they've protected consumers. This is an example from your lifetime to help you understand how the government can be involved in making sure that business is fair and that we protect consumers. Again, I'm a big supporter of laissez-faire economy, a laissez-faire economics and hands-off, and the government does not need to be involved. But this is a good example of how the government can be involved and make sure that people are not getting cheated, people are not getting lied to. And it's a good example of, yeah, maybe we do need the government. Now, devil's advocate, my point of view is, you are an idiot if you believed this. And I think a lot of people are with me. Maybe that's a little, that's probably a little harsh and I probably shouldn't say that, but whatever. YouTube's going to have to blame me. Uh, let's say, let's not say idiot. That's probably too offensive. Let's just say you are a, a bad consumer if you believed this. If you need the government to step in to tell you that these are not magic shoes 
and they will not allow you to fly, they will not magically turn your body around, then we've got a whole bunch of other problems. I don't believe we need the government to create, to get involved in this, to protect people because they bought dumb shoes. Now, there are other examples where, like in terms of a medicine, where if a medicine, they say like this medicine is going to cure a disease and it doesn't and you die, then yeah, we probably need the government to get involved in that. But again, a lot of foolish, ridiculous claims are made by businesses. A lot of the stuff they try to sell you is ridiculous. And I don't know if we need the government to be our in loco or be in loco parentis or, or act like a parent because we are too silly and we are not using our brains. Maybe we should just use our brains and realize, you know how you get firm buttocks? You work out more and you eat better and you take care of yourself. There isn't a shortcut to health. Otherwise, we would all be in great shape if it were all this easy. Or, of course, you can just have a big government step in. Uh, last, the government needs to be involved in the nation's financial health. Basically, the money in the economy. Recessions, depressions, no more panics. He thinks the government needs to play a big role regulating business, or regulating banks to regulate the amount of money that's in the economy to so make sure that it's steady and that people have what they need. If you look at the 19th century, we've talked about, we talked about the panic of 1893 in videos prior to this one, but there have been plenty of panics throughout America. I mean, it's very routine, very normal for these panics to occur. And in most of the time, these were bank failures, bank failures, financial issues, bank failures, bank failures, bank failures. Almost always. It always has to do with the supply of money in the economy either being too high or being too low. A lot of times it's a too low situation. And what Woodrow Wilson is going to propose is we need the government, not individual private banks. The government needs to regulate the amount of money in the economy so that we can prevent all these panics, steady flow of economy, and that will lead to the economy growing. I need to erase all that from the screen so that I can show what I want to show. All right. So typically, the economy, it says income or GDP, basically just imagine that that's money. Good money. People have money to spend. Things are getting bought and sold. Typically, what happens over time, the economy goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down. That is completely natural. These cycles happen. That's why this stuff maybe isn't that crazy. These panics, panic probably is an exaggerated word, but it's going to happen. There's good times, there's bad times. We just experienced a bad time about 10 years ago, and now we are on upswing again. The plan then is that what we should do is try to reduce the bad times and lengthen the good times. That is the ultimate goal of the government. Before, the banks, sure, they kind of would like that to happen, but they also realize that these things are naturally going to happen. What the government says is we need to be more active to maybe stabilize this. We want to try to create constant growth. But even if when we're growing, we're going up and going down, we want to make sure that our times that we go down are less and the times that we go up are longer. That's very hard to do with a bunch of different banks across the country that are controlling the money supply. All the different banks are doing their own thing, lending money, not lending money. It's up to them. Woodrow Wilson says, we need to have control over this. We need the government to put the banks under control of the government. As we close up real quick, the idea, again, is that a low supply of money is good because it increases the value of money. And this is going to be mainly for the next video. But if the government prints way too much money or if the individual banks lend out too much money or print out too much money, that then causes the value of the money to go down. We're going to talk more about this. We've talked about inflation in videos before. And we will talk about them again. And that's going to be the crux of the next conversation in terms of the Federal Reserve, which is what we're going to talk about 
in that they will be created by Woodrow Wilson to control the supply of money to prevent panics. We want steady growth. And when we do have a decline, we want it to be quick, get it over with, and go back to growing. And we can do that if we control the supply of money. We don't get out of hand with the supply of money. We don't want, well, we want the value to be high. We do not want the value to be low. So the Federal Reserve will be created. We're going to talk more about this in the next video. It's called the Fed. It is the banker's bank. This is where the banks go to get money. You go to the bank to get money. The banks go to the Fed. It is the U.S. government's bank. It is the new version of the National Bank that was killed off by Andrew Jackson in the 1830s, the second National Bank. We will not have one for the longest time. Now we go back to the Federal Reserve. You can say a lot of things about the Federal Reserve. There's a lot of people who really, really despise the Federal Reserve because the Federal Reserve is not really controlled by the government. It's like this separate entity controlled by private investors. But I'm not going to go into that. You can look in your study guide and you can check out online and find out a lot of more information about the Federal Reserve. I'm going to stick to the AP US guidelines. This is how they manage money in the economy created by Woodrow Wilson. So we will talk more about inflation in the Fed in the next video. But we did talk about Woodrow Wilson's ways of protecting the economy. We talked about the monopolies. I'm just going to put monop. We talked about the FTC protecting the consumers. And we also talked about ending tariffs. That was his triple wall of privilege, all about, basically about protecting the people. And these are progressive ideas. These are new ideas. The monopolies have been around for, or well, had a lot of power. So it was kind of revolutionary to get rid of the power from big business. Again, to help the people was not necessarily the norm or normal and to ban tariffs Although I, that may not be a progressive idea. This is an idea that comes and goes um, throughout time.